You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor for The Griot and associate professor of political science at Fordham University. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of The Blackest Questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about black history, past and present. So here's the way this works. We have five rounds of questions about us, black history, the whole diaspora, current events, everything. With each round, the questions will get a little bit tougher, and the guest has 15 seconds to get it right. If they answer the question correctly, they will receive one symbolic black fist and hear this. If they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we'll still love them anyway. After the five questions, there'll be a black bonus question round, which I call Black Lightning, at the end just for fun. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Jason Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a professor, political analyst, and public speaker known for his ability to break down stories with wit and candor. Dr. Johnson is the author of the political consultants and campaigns, One Day to Sell. He's a tenured professor at the School of Global Journalism and Communication at Morgan State University in my favorite city, Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Johnson has an extensive public speaking and media background, ranging from pop culture to politics. He's a political contributor and host at MSNBC and host of A Word with Jason Johnson, which is a podcast on Slate. He's also an avid comic book collector and comic book fan and a long-suffering Seahawks fan. Jason, thank you so much for joining The Blackest Questions. And some of our listeners may remember Jason and I had a podcast called What's In It For Us on The Griot. Welcome! I just want to let you know that I had not planned this, but I am wearing a Black Lightning t-shirt, so I'm prepared for the Black Lightning round. And if there are any questions about Black Lightning, I know all about Jefferson Pierce and his entire family. I'm set. I'm good to go. Listen, I have missed you so terribly. I absolutely loved when we had What's In It For Us, when we just, the two of us, I mean, We really just like shot the shit for like an hour. Basically, hey, you know, shout out to the Griot and (laughs) shout out to everyone who made that happen because we were literally allowed to just, thank you, Byron, Alan, to literally just have 30 minutes to an hour of the two of us just talking about politics, pop culture, shenanigans, mayhem, chaos, and whatever we felt like when it came to Black people. It was fantastic. I, re- I really want the audience to know that the only difference between what's in it for us and how Chrissy and I usually actually talk is the lack of profanity and slurs. That's really... <laughs> it's, true. Only, it's true. That's, that's really the only difference. It is Out so of the true. same conversation. I mean, I try, you know, we try and make ourselves quasi-respectable for the air and, you know, use these, like, titles, but other than that i mean it is a whole bunch of whether it's comic books or pop culture or television or you know why is everybody wearing eyelashes i don't know i mean these are things that we discuss on text and they just kind of came out in the podcast jason are you ready to play the blackest questions just want to add this i was actually a contestant on the weakest link so i am prepared for this oh. totally prepared for this oh i'm learning new stuff every day well here's <laughs> our here's our first question let's see if you're the weakest link when it comes to black folks <laughs> Question number one. She was the first Ivy League African-American president and recently came out of retirement to lead as president of an HBCU. Who is she? Oh, jeez. I'm a political scientist, not a historian. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's Janetta Coles, is it? Because I don't think she was an Ivy League. I mean, she was a president of the Spelman. Mm-hmm. Um and I was trying to think of the president on that one show, The Quad, on BET, um, but that's not a real person. <laughs> no, this is a real person, not a fictitious character. And it's not Julianne Malvo, because Julianne Malvo was a president, I believe, of Bennett, but not of an Ivy League university. I am, I, can I, can I call Stop. a black friend? No, Stop. the black friend that you're calling is me. It's Dr. <laughs> Ruth Simmons. I, I didn't know. I didn't okay. know. I didn't well, know. <laughs> Dr. Simmons, before she was president of Brown, she was president of Smith College, and I, I spent some time at Smith College on a fellowship. But in 2001, Ruth Simmons made history when she became the first African-American president of an Ivy League university, as well as Brown University's first female president. And after five years of retirement from Brown, Simmons was invited to take on the presidency at Prairie View a and University and HBCU in Texas. Shout out to our colleague, Melanie Price, who's also a tenured professor at Prairie View A&M. And since 2017, she's continued to serve as president of Prairie View. So Dr. Simmons, I mean, you know, when I say in the pantheon of like brilliant black women who are just leading the charge in academia, uh, she's clearly on the Mount Rushmore of all things. Just, you know, she's with Janetta Cole, Dr. Janetta Cole, I should say, uh, on this pantheon. But, you know, we're both in academia 
And I know that, you know, before you went to grad school and went to undergrad, you were an army brat and traveled all over. Did you ever spend much time in Texas when you were traveling no. around? I can literally, like, honestly, Dr. Greer, I have been in Texas a grand total of three times in my entire life. Oh, like I really was that passing not, through Dallas Fort Worth Airport to go. I someplace? mean, basically, basically, like I went to Houston once, I went to Austin once for a wedding, and I think I was in Dallas Airport on my way to another wedding. Like I know nothing, mm. <laughs> like littler. No, I'm sorry, no, I had one other trip to San Antonio. So yeah, three times. That's it. That's all I know about Dallas. That's, that's all I know about Texas. So, I, and and in fact, I also say, you know, because neither of my parents went to HBCUs. And because uh, my father was in the military, moved around a lot, I actually didn't grow up around a lot of people with the HBCU experience. They didn't have mm. fraternity brothers or sisters or aunts and uncles who came by. Um, and, and it's interesting because in my family, while there has been a push for kids to go to HBCUs, most of the parents in my family have not. So right. my, well, my was, lack of history, that's my justification. It's, it's actually, even though Ruth Simmons was the president of an HBCU and an IB. Right? You know what? <laughs> you know I'm not going to let you off the hook. You know I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm trying. I'm trying here. I'm trying to dance my way out of it. It's the best I can do. Like I said, I couldn't name the lady from the quad either. And I watched both seasons of that show. So, you know. Well, I, I always tell people I went to an HWCU. So my mom went to an HBCU to Florida Memorial. I have cousins who went to Spelman and Morehouse and Howard and FAM uh, in, in Tallahassee. But I mean, I went to an HWCU because the same way that HBCUs were set up for the knowledge and excellence of Black people, I went to Tufts, which is, you know, initially set up for the knowledge, production, and excellence of white men. So it's it's an HWCU as far as I'm concerned. I kind of have you beat there. I went to the University of Virginia, which was created by a white man so that he could have access to all of the young women that he had enslaved at that particular time to work out his issues after his wife died. So, uh, so you're like, I, so in the pantheon of horrible white men founding schools, you yeah, win. I, I kind of have you beat. Just wanted to mention that he built the entire school around his ability to have access to enslaved women. But and I then do denied ask, it for years. Of course, because he was quote unquote dating. How do you date someone who's enslaved? Don't even get me started. That's going to be a tangent. This is a whole nother episode. But you know, you did go to two universities in the deep South. So you went to UVA as an undergrad, and then for postgraduate studies, your alma mater is University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which is in many ways considered a public Ivy League institution yeah. uh, because so much of the uh, the norms and the mindset and the, I, I would just say, the, the patterns of HWCU exclusionary practices are so poignant in the North and the South and all these institutions. What's, um, before we take a quick break, what's one one pointed memory that you have of your time at UNC Chapel Hill. You know, it's interesting. Good my time. Uh, oh, no, I, I would say that the vast majority of my time at UNC Chapel Hill uh, on campus was not great uh, because it was the PhD program. And I'll tell you this. And I've Which I call college with no fun. <laughs> right, exactly. Completely. It's just in a, in a cost you more. Um, it was interesting going back to my alma mater. Uh, I, I had I had great faculty there. Dan Gitterman, shout out uh, the School of Public Policy, one of my favorite people. But my department itself, I point this out. I believe I was only the fifth African-American to get a PhD in political science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I was the fifth, and that was 2009. So let that sink in. That ain't a reflection of how smart I am. That's a reflection of what that institution was like and how it treated the black people who tried to go there. So that's that speaks volumes about what my experience was at in the department at UNC Chapel Hill, although the city itself and the graduate school experience outside, it was great. Fantastic. All right, we'll be right back. You are now listening to The Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Calling all comic book fans, we're debating some Black Panther history on the next Blackest Questions podcast. Don't miss two comic book know-it-alls. Take us on a historical journey. Who will truly claim Wakanda forever? Okay, we're back. I'm here with Dr. Jason Johnson playing the Blackest Questions. He's 0 for 1. Let's see how we do. <laughs> wow, wow, <laughs> wow. You know what? I mean, I got four more, so I'm You prepared. got four more. Thank I you. have Thank faith you. in you, Jason Johnson. <laughs> okay, question number two. You ready to rock and roll? I'm ready to rock and roll, which is black. Just pointing out, That's I know the right. rock and roll is black, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> question number two. Blending the African diaspora with science, philosophy, and technology, this term was coined in the 1990s due to an ever-growing cultural wave that's now being recognized as a powerful creative force that has long been a part of black popular culture. What is it called? I think that's a really complicated way to ask about Afrofuturism. <laughs> that's uh, 
<laughs> you are correct. So Afrofuturism is a cultural aesthetic that combines science fiction, history, and fantasy to explore the African-American experience and aims to connect the Black diaspora with their African ancestry. Afrofuturism contains themes of reclamation, Black liberation, and revisioning of the past and predictions of the future through a Black cultural lens in common. Afrofuturism is a cultural aesthetic that combines science fiction, history, and fantasy. It also evaluates the past and future to create better conditions for the present generation of Black people through the use of technology, often presented through art, music, and literature. So I know that you're basically an expert on this topic. Yes. So give us some of your favorite film and television examples of Afrofuturism for our audience. Um, so obviously there's the, there's the big clear one, which is like Black Panther. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not just Black Panther the movie. It's also sort of Black Panther the comic book. There's also Mosaic. Uh, there was a great book that came out in the 90s called Zero uh, about a Black man who was an assassin who had to dress like a white man in order to sneak into different kinds of environments and actually do his job. Um, there's an example of sort of Black steampunk semi-Afrofuturism, uh, the Eisner Award-winning book Bitterroot, which is actually being turned into a movie by Regina King. Basically, Ooh. imagine like a steampunk version of the Ghostbusters. It takes place in 1920s Harlem. Um, so these are all recent things. I'm working on my own graphic novel right now uh, that I'm really super excited about, but it's it's on the it's on the it's on the down low. I got to be very very quiet about what I'm working on. Um, but I always I always say this about Afrofuturism and sci-fi and everything else like that. This stuff isn't new. All the science fiction, all the science fiction is essentially rooted in black people, <laughs> and most people don't realize this. You know, Marie Shelley wrote Frankenstein as an allegory about the Haitian Revolution. Frankenstein mm -hmm. was the monster that white colonialists had created that they had to take down. Baybar the Elephant that we read as kids was about whether or not you could assimilate Africans into French culture. Isaac Asimov's Rules of Robots, right? They were based on slave codes. Why? Because the word robot has its root in Czechoslovakian language for the word slave. OK, all of this stuff. So every time you see a movie about robots rising up and gaining consciousness and killing the white folks who created them, it is literally a metaphor for black people. So, oh you know, I, I've always thought that Afrofuturism, it's great and it makes sense and it works, but it, it almost people get caught up in that term and forget that every single element of science fiction uh, from the Terminator to uh, uh, Planet of the Apes and everything else like that, they're usually metaphors for how white society has tried to wrestle with the existence of black people who they attempted to enslave who one day broke free. Which also seems like, I hear you saying, in the undergirding conversation is also the fear of black people rising up. Exactly. So fear is the undercurrent of so much of this conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. I love, I see. And, you know, the thing is, dude, this isn't really my genre. You know, I love a good 30 minute sitcom and that's yes. what I watch over and over again. Like I'm four years old. I can literally just watch the same movie for, you know, the next six years in a row. Um, but OK, before we take a quick break, who's your favorite Afrofuturistic author that you really enjoy reading and reading? Ooh, favorite Afrofuturistic author right now? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I read uh, Nettie Okafor. Uh, I think she's done some good stuff. I like I liked Eve Ewing's, um, you know, the author Eve Ewing. I, oh, yeah. I liked her writing on Ironheart. Um, I can say I interviewed uh, Phil Boutte, uh, who is a conception, who's, who's a designer who helped come up with the costumes for Black Panther and Wakanda Forever. Mm -hmm. And while he's not a writer, I mean, the way that he creates costumes and the way that he sort of does world building, uh, I'm a huge fan of. So there's a lot of people who are sort of involved in the steps of creating and sort of mainstreaming Afrofuturism uh, that I'm a fan of. Can't think of a specific author because I yeah. think there's, it's it's involved in too much. Well, I will say I've, I've read uh, some of Nettie Okafor and I actually really enjoyed it. And that's not my genre, but I thought it was a great introduction for someone like me who's right. like, yeah, this isn't really my thing. I thought her writing was really accessible. And I say that as a compliment. And then obviously e-viewing. Shout out to e-viewing. Um, you know, I, I always every year on the anniversary of Emmett Till's death, I mm -hmm. always post a, a poem that she wrote about Emmett Till, which I think is the most beautiful thing. Thing, so for our listeners. So let's take a quick break. And I'm here with Dr. Jason Johnson. You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Okay, we're back. I'm here with my dear, dear friend. <laughs> we're playing the Black's Questions. You're doing pretty well. One I feel one. smarter now. You I feel smarter. smarter. That's right. I'm at 50%. Osmosis. I feel woman's flame. Now I can't red pill. I'm just saying. Well, you know, I've always given you a hard time about your shenanigans and mayhem. Um, okay, question number three. You ready to rock? 
I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to Millie rock. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Question number three. He is known most notably to serve as co-anchor on ABC World News Tonight alongside Peter Jennings from 1978 until 1983 as the first black network news anchor in the United States. Who is he? Goodness gracious. It could have been easier if you said Bernard Shaw, who we just recently lost. I know Bernard. Um, from 1979 to 1983. 1978 to 1983. Co anchored ABC World News Tonight alongside the late Peter Jennings. Co anchored late ABC. I mean, Lester's still here. Bernard just passed. This is, this is, this is, I, I'm, I'm racking my brain. I know it's not, um, Gosh, I think I think I think I might be stumped. I mean, I'm trying I'm trying to think. This is this would be a time that I would like call Roland Martin and he would talk my ear off for 20 minutes as to why I don't know this. Right. Like, Brother, why don't you know right. this? So, Roland would be like shaming me right now for like and then had like offer me seven books that I should have read. Right. Um, so the I answer think, is Max Robinson. And I want to remind our listeners, this is not a show where we get everything right. This is a show so we can all learn more about Black people and Black culture. She's trying to cover for me. Is what, no, because what you're brilliant. But I mean, and you know, listen, I've been on the on the other side of the hot seat, and I was 0 for 3 when I was on our, our dear friend uh, Panama's uh, podcast for the Creo. Uh, so Max Robinson started his broadcasting career as a disc jockey in his hometown of Richmond, Virginia, and they moved to Washington in 1965. And after becoming the first Black person to co-anchor a national news broadcast at ABC in 1978, he spoke about the racial prejudice at his workplace to a Smith College audience actually in 1981. In 1983, he left the network after being demoted and lasted only two years at Chicago's WMAQ before leaving to freelance, and he essentially disappeared from public view, but he spoke out frequently on behalf of better treatment and more visibility for Blacks in the media. So we have Max Robinson to thank for our careers on various networks and what we do as we sit alongside uh, other scholars and intellects and journalists, but also as we host and co-host various shows. And so you mentioned Bernard Shaw, and so Max Robinson was said to be close friends with Bernard Shaw for over 20 years. We recently lost, as you mentioned. Um, and so we've commented, you know, we've thought about Shaw's impact on reporting these last few weeks. But do you think that Black journalists get recognized as much as some of their counterparts I mean, the fact that we don't know who Max Robinson is, to me, is a disgrace uh, in what we're doing in the larger media sphere. Well, I think I think there's a difference between what your average news consumer should know and like what my obligation should be as a faculty mm -hmm. member at a school of journalism. Um, I mean, because I could name a ton of anchors and I can name a ton of reporters. Right. But the history of journalism may or may not be something that most people actually know. I think if you ask your average American, can you name the nightly news anchor in the town you grew up in? They can't tell you. Can you name who could, could most people tell you if they were shown pictures, who is Dan Rather, who is Peter Jennings, uh, and who is Tim Russert? I bet you most people wouldn't know. I mean, I, I really don't think most people would actually remember those things. Maybe our parents' age would. So I think we have this tendency sometimes to disassociate from the people who deliver us news. They come into our homes every single night, or at least they did for the last 15 years or so. I don't think most people would know that. And so, you know, and certainly when it comes to black folk, I mean, probably some of the longest tenured journalists that had the biggest impact on my life, uh, besides Bernard Shaw, was like Gwen Eiffel, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I watched Gwen Eiffel when I was a kid, um, Bryant Gumbel, um, right. you know, Stuart Scott. Like these are the people who I grew up watching. But I think in today's sort of diversified media environment, I don't know who those people will be. I mean, probably Joy. Joy Reid, but that's probably the most consistent face, her and Lester Holt, probably the most consistent faces that anybody in Gen Y or Gen Z are ever going to see. Right. And I think we've sort of made this shift from network to cable representation. Right. And so I definitely think that Joy Reid uh, is, is in that pantheon now because so many people um, don't even watch local TV anymore. Right. I mean, I think it's so interesting that you mentioned Brian Gumbel because, you know, I mean, he's such a prolific journalist and, you know, now he's moved over to sort of sports with his brother, Greg. But I definitely remember it was such a big deal that he was on the Today Show. Oh, yeah. Morning. You yes. know, the fact that he was he was on our television. We had that that tiny little black and white TV in the kitchen. And mm -hmm. so when, when I'm eating my pop tarts and strawberries before I went to school, he was there, you know, with what was it? Katie Couric? It was Katie Couric. Yes. Um, yes. In the morning. And, you know, he just, there was, there was a, a level of intellect about him that just seemed so far beyond mm -hmm. many of the conversations he was having. 
Brian Gumbel is is one of the many people in journalism and one of the sort of the media entities that I always say, I appreciate that he got to do a lot of his work prior to the internet. And here's why. He took a lot of heat uh, on black radio and sort of black commentary that existed pre-internet about not being black enough, about mm -hmm. not addressing issues that were concerns of our community. And, you know, and, and he was usually like, hey, you know, it's not my job. It's first thing in the morning. I got to work with Katie. But if you see the second half of his career, what he's done with real sports oh on Brian Gumbel, clearly oh this gosh. is a guy who was always down, right? <laughs> I know you hear the right thing. But as African Americans, all of us are used to hearing stuff and knowing bull when we hear it. You know, I, I don't know if it is at the time, but I know that the results are. Goodness. Like the things that he's done, and I and I believe at this point, I mean, he's been doing real sports with Brian Gumble for at least twenty years. At least twenty years, because yeah. I remember when he first started doing it. I was like, "Hey, isn't that your your brother's band with? <laughs> like, right. why are you stepping on Greg's toes?" Right. But I mean, right. the 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 content, the the level of the stories that he's yes. telling yes. in real sports is so elevated. I mean, it's it's beyond a thirty for thirty. It's a real yes. deep investigative journalistic dive that really shows that he's you know he was so disinterested in making pancakes at eight in the morning he, he almost like couldn't even hide it he was like i'm not here for this banter in the hawaiian shirt with you willard scott i don't care like and even as a kid i picked up on it, it was right, like right right you know and, and i think there was this interesting dynamic of this black man who was also seen as like not nice to his white female cohort. yes 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 i mean he He's got mean quote unquote to her we we didn't have the word shady in 1991 but you could just like if the camera it was very like the office you know if the camera would just pan to brian gumble he's like why am i here why oh hey girl. hey katie right <laughs> we didn't say girl back in the day but if right. we could brian gumble would be a meme that was like girl g-r-l right. exclamation point <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's you know what we need to have a whole separate episode. Yes, drip just to, with this day. Yes, just yes, to go yes. down the rabbit hole of the Today Show. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break with Jason Johnson. We'll be right on back. You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Okay, we're back. I'm here with my dear friend Jason Johnson. We're playing the Blackest Questions, and we are here for question number four. Jason, yes, you're doing all right. I so I appreciate you being here. I'm adequate. I'm one for three at this particular point. It's so hard in the hot is, seat. It is, is really hard is in the hot seat. really challenging for me. I got to tap into my inner black lightning. I'm ready. And I, and I get lovely DMs and texts from our listeners who are just like, I got two out of five this week. You know, and it's, it's really... It's really hard to be in the hot seat. I mean, I've had the tables turned and I did not do well. So <laughs> I get it. Okay, question number four. Featuring prominent African-American and other black historical figures, this is one of the only museums in the nation dedicated to the preservation of African-American history. What museum is it? My first thought would have been the Motown Museum um, or the Archives of the Source Awards, but the actual answer is the Blacksonian, the National Museum of African American History that is in Washington, D.C., where the Grio had a party uh, during the White House Correspondents' Dinner just a couple months ago. Well, actually, for the sake of this question, it's actually the National Greek Blacks and Wax Museum in Baltimore, <laughs> Maryland. What? What? I was only 40 minutes away. Just, listen, you're, you're down the road. Um, so, and this is actually my aunt's museum, um, Dr. Oh. Joe Ed Martin, who's, uh, she and her late husband were both professors at Coppin, also in Maryland. Um, so the Great Blacks and Wax Museum was established in 1983 in, in a downtown storefront on Saratoga Street in Baltimore, or Baltimore, as they say. And since its opening, the museum has become a prominent nationally recognized institution. It's evolved into a powerful compendium of wax figures. It houses approximately 150 figures of people wow. from the past, from obviously Dr. King and Rosa Parks to the uh, President Obama. Well, there's also, this is my favorite section, there's also a section on Black Baltimoreans. So various politicians and individuals who have made the city of Baltimore such a great and beautiful city. And I always tell all of my students, you have to have two favorite cities, one favorite U.S. city, one non-U.S. city. And Baltimore, Maryland is my absolute favorite U.S. city. 
So before we get into your work, I've never understood that, but that's just fine. I know you love, I mean, look, there's pretty things in Baltimore. It's it's never been my favorite. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be my favorite city. It wouldn't be my top three favorite American cities. Charm City, the city that reads Enoch Pratt libraries, the cobblestone streets, the skyline, the architecture. I mean, it was in competition with New York. New York went with, you know, finance. Baltimore went with shipping. New York won. Fine. But the air in Baltimore, my skin is amazing whenever I'm there. It's on the water. Oh, the birds are there. This is when I tell people, you know, all these people like to listen to Go Go and go to Washington, D.C., whatever. <laughs> go to, to Baltimore. It's way more than just crabs. It is, when I say it's called Charm City for a reason, there is a level of beauty and joy that that city brings me. What's your favorite U.S. city since you've moved around a lot? I, you know, my favorite U.S. city would probably be Atlanta. I mean, that's not that's oh, not the most creative Jason thing Johnson. for a black American to say, but I absolutely really like not. I really that's like, like my favorite city. restaurant's Golden Corral. Hey, you know what? First off, P.F. Chang's. Thank you. Get it right. Second, <laughs> second, coming to a strip mall near you. Um, no, I actually really like Atlanta. I've always like it. I, I like seeing all sorts of black and brown people all the time. Um, I like that there are tons of things you can do. I don't really tend to. I mean, it, it's interesting. Lots of cities have amazing history. Blah blah blah. You can go see the history. That's not what presses me. I mean, yes, I've I've been to the the MLK Library. I've been to sort of you know historic Georgia things. I just literally like the energy of the city. I always have. And That's I lived the there for 10 years. Like it just, it just feels, it just feels comfortable um, when I'm actually there. And even as the traffic has gotten worse and even if they've had their sort of interesting political things one way or another, I actually, it's, it is a place that you can live and mm-hmm. actually enjoy in multiple parts of your life. I think there's a lot of cities that are fun, like as a teenager or in your twenties or thirties or fifties or sixties or seventies, Atlanta is a city that you can enjoy throughout your entire life. Like I wouldn't mm. want to live in LA as a senior citizen. It would be oh awful. gosh. Right. And I mean, and as, as a New Yorker, I'm thinking like, when do I have to leave this city? Because right. going up and down these subway stairs, if I'm 85 mm-hmm. years old and getting no. pushed by the riffraff, I don't know if that's really for me, but I will exactly. say this. I mean, Baltimore is a blackity black city and has such a beautiful political history. Don't forget, you know, Nancy Pelosi's family, the Delisandros are from there. Long history of black leadership. Um, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates and I, can talk for hours. I mean, I think I may love Baltimore more than he does. Uh, his mm-hmm. first book, Beautiful Struggle, you know, obviously details Baltimore and is an ode. But even <laughs> the first time we ever met and I went off on Baltimore, he was looking at me like, and most Baltimoreans look at me this way. I don't understand how you're not from here and you <laughs> need to work in the tourism bureau. Like, it doesn't make sense that you are this much of a fan of Baltimore and you don't live here. But I've spent so much time. I mean, every free moment I had in high school and college, I was in Baltimore. I'm going in like two weeks, just because. I, I literally, it's funny, I'm just pointing out that if Dr. Greer does not come by and visit me and speak to my department when she's there in two weeks, I'll be quite offended. But she sneaks into the other city and doesn't necessarily tell me. I will say this also about the city. I, you know, while I teach there, while I teach at Morgan State University, which is sort of the the north, uh, sort of the northeastern corner of the city, I always, like, my experience with Baltimore is very much like this biopsy. Like, I come straight mm. in downtown, drive all the way through. I see everything from, like, Fells Point to uh, Camden Yards, and then I sort of go into the, the more sort of unresourced places yeah. that are now beginning to gentrify because it's the last affordable city on the East yeah. Coast that hasn't been completely eaten up by Zillow. So I, I haven't lived there, which I guess sort of changes my experience. I usually go in, I teach, I have the experience and I leave. Well, maybe we'll do a live taping of The Blackest Questions with Jason Johnson in Baltimore. Uh, I implore all of our listeners to go to Baltimore. But, you know, the running joke about Baltimore before we take a quick break is, you know, people always said, uh, if the world is coming to an end, move to Baltimore because everything in Baltimore happens 20 years later. So... <laughs> safe and sound. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're going to take a break. You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Okay, we're back. I'm here with my dear, dear friend, Dr. Jason Johnson, and we're playing the Blackest Questions. Jason Johnson, are you ready for question number five? I am ready to win this question because apparently the rest of these have been fixed. This entire thing is rigged. The whole system is rigged, and I am prepared for questions that I can actually answer that haven't been based specifically on things I won't know. So I'm prepared. Okay. I'm ready. Well, I will come on a word with Jason Johnson at any time and be in the hot seat, and you can just, you. you can ask me all types of questions that I should know, and I'll sit there just with my nerves. Like, I don't know, Jason. I don't know. They're going to edit out like 80% of them, but that's fine. Okay, here we go. Question number five. In the late 1960s, the first African-American appeared in mainstream comics. Who is he? 
in mainstream comics? In, and that's the clue, in mainstream comics. Okay, because this is the late 1960s. I believe, all right, so it was it was Fantastic Four number 57 is the first appearance of Black Panther. Black Panther appeared before Jon Stewart, which I think was 1972, Black Lightning, which I think was 1974, but you had a Jungle King character in Gold Key Comics that was actually in the early 60s. Um, and, and actually when Black Panther was first created, he was the cold tiger. He wasn't Black Panther, but if you're saying mainstream, I'm assuming it's Marvel or DC. So that's got to be Black Panther. Okay. Well, according to my research, it's Samuel Wilson, AKA Falcon. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. I, I am, I am disputing this. Okay. I'm well, I will talk to my producers because you know, I'm basically <laughs> Alice Trebek. I'm not, I'm not, right. well, the Falcon, though, this can be a bit tricky for comic fans. This is yeah. according to our research here at the Grio and Blackest Questions. This can be a bit tricky for comic book fans since the first Black superhero to appear in mainstream American comic books is Marvel's The Black Panther, who first appeared in Fantastic Four number 52 in July 1966. The first major Black character to be featured in comic strips, it was in cartoonist Lee Falk's adventure comic strip, Mandrake the Magician, which featured the African supporting character Lothar from its 1934 debut. But Falcon Falcon, introduced by Stan Lee and Gene Colan in 1969 in Captain America, is noted as the first Black character to appear in a mainstream comic. He could fly on mechanical wings and control birds via tele telepathy, and the superhero from Harlem often slipped into the role of Captain America. Mm, no. Okay, listen. <laughs> I, I, I say take it to the Comic-Con crowd. I'm, I'm taking this to the com I'm literally sharing this with my blur group because what, what I, number one, Falcon got his wings from Black Panther. Ooh. So, yeah. So I don't know that he could. Plus, the Falcon wasn't a superhero initially. He was a sidekick. And if you go back to the first sort of mainstream comic, if you're talking Marvel and DC, that would be Mal Duncan who appeared in the 60s version of the Teen Titans. So I I dispute this. I am I am stamping my fist down I and saying I don't think I would say Falcon was the first. It would it would either be Black Panther or you can have Lothar, which is interesting because he was never given any real powers and he mm -hmm. was in part of uh, this Lothar, Flash Jordan, Flash Gordon, Man the Magician. There was a cartoon called Defenders of the Earth in the 80s um, that sort of resurrected that character back. But I I dispute. <laughs> this is okay. So, I, okay. First of all, I love this and I love you. <laughs> this is the first, you know, disputed I know. response <laughs> in the blackest exactly. questions. Now we've got to, to have we've got to <laughs> call the audience and and have people sort of let us know which is which. Um, maybe we should just we should call Marvel and DC and sort of. The, I'm literally I'm literally because, because like if you if you go back and again some of this has to do with your definition of what a superhero is or what okay. a mainstream comic is right okay if mainstream is only Marvel and DC then I'm almost a hundred percent sure that that Black Panther preceded the Falcon, Falcon. released the Falcon when he got his wings because initially he didn't have wings he just had he just had the bird that he had the telepathic communication thing with if you go back to black characters period well yes that goes earlier and I think that would include Mal Duncan who did have powers but was part of the teen titan so some of so this is I'm definition gonna, based i'm gonna take a guess are you really into comics <laughs> i'm just gonna say that i have an access in my brain to wikipedia for all sorts of petty black information well i mean th <laughs> but this isn't petty black information i really appreciate this jason because you know not only have you spoken at comic-con in san diego right i mean so much of at least for me observing how your knowledge and love of comic books has expanded more into the public sphere. It mm -hmm. is also, I mean, going right in lockstep with what this podcast is all about is really making sure people know the history of black people in this country, whether it's right. real or in comic books, right? right. Because right. we have been erased from so much of the narrative and so many of our contributions, it is definitely important. So we'll get it right. We'll have yeah. to have an addendum onto the episode once we figure out whether it's Falcon or Black Panther or maybe the nuance of the language of superhero versus comic book. We'll figure it out. But I think yes. it goes back to your statement about sort of Afrofuturism, where it's just there is also this underlying fear of sort of black people in mainstream anything, black right. people as like leaders and characters of our own stories, black people as like heroes of our own world. Mm -hmm. um, God forbid. 
Right, right. God forbid that they have that kind of agency. God forbid. And if you look at a lot of those characters, because here's the other thing. If you were if you were talking about sort of appearances of people, you could also argue James Rhodes, uh, who was yes, Tony Stark's. Yeah. So if you've ever seen any of those Marvel movies, he's War Machine. He's played by Don Cheadle. Well, we want to take the high ground. OK, so let's okay. put the biggest gun up on that ridge. Gotcha. Right. OK. Uh, yeah, it was initially Terrence Howard, then Don Cheadle. James Rhodes, who became War Machine, appeared in like the first 10 issues, I think, of Iron Man. And, and he eventually became War Machine. So, again, a lot of this has to do with how are you calling somebody a hero and what do you mean by mainstream comic? Because a lot of those sort of black characters appeared very early on and didn't get powers until later, but were considered part of the superhero team. So, huh. you know, Rhodes, uh, Falcon, Jefferson Pierce, T'Challa, all of them, they're all kind of bouncing around the 60s. It depends on which one you want to start with. And I just saw somewhere John Majors is going to be one of the new superheroes coming Yeah, through. so He's so Jonathan Majors, actors. which which most people have discovered him through Lovecraft Country, which if you haven't seen it, is one of the best eight, right. eight episodes of anything that anybody right. has ever seen and indicative of how frustrating our modern media environment can be that you can have a show like that that has such critical acclaim, uh, was rewatched at one of the highest rates of anything over the pandemic uh, and yet couldn't get a second season because mm -hmm. of... Shameful. It's shameful. Yeah, complications. I loved him in um, Last Black Man in San Francisco. That's why I, I first... See, I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen that yet. But him and I He's thought brilliant. him and Journey Smollett and uh, Wumu, Wumu Mosaka, I believe, who played Journey Smollett's sister. I thought so many of the roles in that movie. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Courtney B. Michael Vance, K. Williams. Michael K. Williams. I mean, like, there were tons of just, just too much talent mm -hmm. uh, for, for that particular show. But, yeah, like, there, there's... He's going to be playing, uh, he plays Kang the Conqueror, who, very basic for people who aren't into comic books, is basically this brilliant black man who was a scientist in another dimension, realized that he could build relationships with versions of himself in every single dimension across time and space, and started a war between himself across multiple universes. Oh my gosh. Oh! Yes. Okay, you know what? Here's the deal. This isn't really my genre, as I said before, but I'm going to say we're going to go to that when it comes out. That, that would Wherever be cool. That's going to be next spring. Whether it's next East Coast spring. or West Coast, I'll even dress up, okay? I'm into it. You don't have to put I'm, on a costume, per se. That's just not quite it's okay. a little 40-year-old version not, but not, yeah. <laughs> that's not mandatory? I thought everybody had to dress up all the time. I, this is my cosplay. Okay, this so I'll wear a T-shirt of some sort. Because I want to support you and your interests, and I want to support Jonathan Majors. All right, we're going to take a quick break before we get to Black Lightning. You are now listening to The Griot's Black Podcast Network. Black culture amplified. Okay, Jason, before I let you get out of here, we've got time for the black bonus questions. This is the bonus round. Where there are no right answers, you just tell me how you feel. I like to call it black lightning. Um, and I feel like that sounds like a comic book, so, you know. And I'm lightning quick with my clickety clack, so there we go. And these are just, this is off the dome. You tell me how off you feel, dome. okay? Okay, freestyle. Here we go. Freestyle, that's right. If you had to choose DC or Marvel. Marvel's got more black people. Okay. Uh, Jefferson Pierce, a.k.a. Black Lightning, or Virgil Hawkins, a.k.a. Static? Uh, Virgil Hawkins, all the way. Groundbreaking roles for black women in Afrofuturism TV and comics goes to Michonne from The Walking Dead or Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek? Definitely Lieutenant Uhura. I actually didn't like how Michonne was written in The Walking Dead for a very, very long time. And then when they decided to ignore the relationships that she had with African-American men and partner her up with Rick, which made absolutely no sense at the end of the show, I really think they wasted what had been built with her in the comic book. Mm. Russell Wilson or Warren Moon? Oh, now, all right, Russell Wilson or Warren Moon. I would have to say Warren Moon only for this reason. Russell Wilson is one of my favorite football players. Warren Moon, there was so much racism in the NFL that when he was drafted, they wouldn't let him play quarterback. So he had to go to Canada and won four Canadian Super Bowls before he was able to come back to the United States and play as a quarterback. So that to, to fight through that kind of racism and still be that impressive, for that time, I have to give a slight edge to Warren Moon, but Russell Wilson is currently my 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 current favorite black quarterback. Okay, better stand up, Chris Rock or Martin Lawrence? I have never liked Martin Lawrence, and I've never thought he was funny. <laughs> it's good. It's got. I'm just. I'm gonna say. I've never thought. Never thought Martin Lawrence was funny. I I've watched a grand total of three episodes of Martin, the TV show. It's just not funny. And, and I and I love Tashina Arnold, and I love her. And everybody hates Chris. And 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 she was funny in the clips I've seen from. But I was never never a big fan of Martin. But I mean, even Martin stand up. No, I, I I always thought his stand was a little blue for me, okay. and and I I didn't I didn't find his show funny. I I don't even think I've seen. I think I've seen one one bad boys. 
Oh, interesting. <laughs> I know. Super hot. <laughs> yeah, I'm always like, you mind if I drink a Kapow. glass of water? Okay, interesting. <laughs> We're gonna have to have a whole conversation about Martin because I have some I have some real thoughts. Okay, better <laughs> voice, Aretha or Whitney? Hmm, probably Whitney, just because I'm more familiar with her music, but also because her songs have resonated with me more. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I were a musicologist, if I were someone who actually knew music, I would give a more honest answer. So Whitney, for me, based on my ignorance of what octaves are actually supposed to be and how people are supposed to sound. Okay, because I'm going to have to play you some Aretha, but that's okay. (laughs) Um, Because I'm like, I'm going with Martin Lawrence. I'm going with Aretha. Um, Would you want to live in Wakanda? Uh, No. Uh, I would not want to live in Wakanda. And the main reason why is because people don't understand this because it's a part of the comic, but they, you know, they sort of, they clean it up for MCU. Wakandans are kind of racist and they don't really like foreigners. And it's, it's a theocratic monarchy, even though ta Coates sort of wrote the change of the monarchy into a more democratic system, but it's a theocratic monarchy full of xenophobic elitists. And so if I were to show up, they probably wouldn't look too kindly upon me. Literally the whole movie is about them basically deciding if they want to deal Deal with us nasty mongrelized African Americans right. as opposed to keep their pure people back in their own country. So, I mean, Zamunda, I might want to kick it there. That seems like a relatively nice place. But Wakanda, I would have to be there on a research grant in, in the hopes that I'd be treated yeah. with respect. I was totally team Killmonger all the way. I was like, I don't understand why everyone's like against Killmonger. I'm like, I'm with him. I understand you had a your bad beat, bro. plan because his plan was terrible. <laughs> but I was like, I get the beat. Okay. Um, who's your favorite comic book hero? Um, by powers, by powers, my favorite comic book hero is the flash. Okay. I've always thought the idea of super speed and whatever would be amazing by reading just pure unadulterated enjoyment. My favorite character is probably Spider-Man. I've loved Spider-Man since I was a kid. I've always thought that, that his, his struggle, the sort of working class kid thing, um, even though that was not my life, it made sense to me. He was a superhero who had real world problems about making his own costume and paying rent and stuff like that. Uh, and he always had a sort of acerbic sense of humor, which made sense to me. Okay, last question. What is your prized possession? I have been keeping journals and diaries since I was in seventh grade. Uh, on days when I'm feeling particularly reflective, I can literally look back on, you know, you know, August 27th and look at what I was thinking on that day over the last 35 or 40 years of my life within that month. It has been one of the greatest gifts I've ever made for myself. I also took almost every single major email between me and loved ones and friends all throughout graduate school and undergrad and printed them out and put them in folders. So I can look back on my entire life, my journals and my collection of old emails and my prized possession to keep me humble. It gives me a lot of insight about life. And one day they will be gifts that I give to my own kids so they know what their dad was actually thinking about drugs when he was in college. <laughs> I adore you. Um, <laughs> Jason, I just want to thank you so much for joining us on The Blackest Questions. Um, promise you'll come back. I will definitely come back and I will have you on my podcast and then you can give me all sorts of shenanigans and heat there and tell me that I'm a terrible, unloyal person, but we will have a field day. Well, and also, I mean, Jason Johnson, for our listeners, I mean, most of you know that he is part of the Griot family. He sometimes writes for the Griot, but obviously he he joins us on our various podcasts on the Black Podcast Network at the Griot. And so I just want to thank Jason Johnson for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Blackest Questions. This show is produced by Akila Shedrick, Jesse Vargas, and Sasha Armstrong. If you like what you heard, please download the Grio app and listen and watch many more great shows and share it with everyone you know. So was Jason Johnson right or wrong? Wrong. I, I, am, I am disputing this. We're bringing in a comic book writer and expert to help us figure this out. So don't miss next week's episode of The Blackest Questions. We're bringing Jason back, and he'll be joined by comic book expert and writer Evan Narcisse. Don't forget, you can listen to the Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are.